these things to police yourselves to reduce your individual risk of, of sexual assault. Keep doing all of this. But think with me for a minute about what this implies about men. If you don't police yourself, if you don't constantly remain aware of what you're wearing, where you are, who you're with, if you don't constantly monitor and police yourself, what this implies about men is that we are wild, out of control animals and we will be all over you. I think we can do better than that as men. I think we need to bring men into this conversation. So I have a strategy about how to do that. This was a, a strategy that was developed originally by a guy at, um, at Ohio State. Um, and then I've been taking it to college campuses around the country. Um, and uh, so here, here it is. Guys will know what this is. Guys, you know what this is? Right, the urinal thing. It actually has a technical plumbing supply term. It's called a splash guard. But it's the, don't worry, this is a new one. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is the thing that would be resting at the bottom of a urinal in a men's room. Now what I want you to see is what you would be seeing if you were using it as directed. You would see the following. You hold the power to stop rape in your hand. Get it? That is, sexual assault depends on the choices men make, the choices we make with our bodies. We could end rape in this country today if men made different choices about what we do with our bodies. The missing piece in our conversation about sexual assault, it seems to me, has been men's choices. That men have some accountability here, that men need to be brought into this conversation. Because that's the piece that we frequently leave out by putting the entire burden on women's self-policing. Now, I've made the argument to you tonight that this is in men's interest to do so. That the very things women have identified that will enable them to live the lives they want to live, lives where they have balancing their work and their family lives, lives where they are animated by passionate romantic relationships, where they are, feeling, where they are free to be safe enough to express their own, uh, their own ideas, their own entitlement. Those are the very things we men need to live the lives we say we want to live. We say we want to have those kinds of friendships. We say we want to have those kind of relationships with our partners, with our spouses. We say we want to have those kind of relationships with our children. The only way we will be able to have those kind of relationships is to support women's efforts to, to create gender equality. Gender equality is not a loss for men. It might be the best thing that's ever happened for us. I'd like to close then with one sentence. I did a book um, some years ago that was a documentary history of men who had supported feminism in the United States from 1776. Now, I know what you're thinking. A history of men who'd supported feminism, the world's shortest book. In fact, it's the fattest book I ever did. It's like 800 pages. And because um, I found thousands of documents by men since 1776 supporting virtually everything, every reform ever introduced by women. And I wanted to share with you one sentence from one of those documents written in 1916 by a writer in New York in a magazine. Uh, the writer was Floyd Dell. And he wrote an article called Feminism for Men. And this is the first line of that article. He said, feminism will make it possible for the first time for men to be free. Thank you very much.